to get the hang of this thing. Why has it got all these levers? It's an off-the-road vehicle. Oh. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> How many vehicles do you know that can double up as a mobile cinema? How many that can literally do anything and go anywhere? Well, there's one, the good old Land Rover. Been there, done it, climbed it. Say hello most to one of the world's vehicles. Most versatile. And the Land Rover has to be one of the British motor industry's biggest success stories, and it's one that's still going strong. And remember, it's a British invention designed almost 50 years ago. It's one of those vehicles that people are proud to be seen in. It's very British. You sort of feel, I can plow through anything in this. It's a beautiful vehicle. I think most military vehicles have a kind of beauty um, to them, which is a great irony since they, they do <laughs> things which are so ghastly. Um, but rugged vehicles. Old Land Rovers are terribly British. They're made of aluminium. They don't fall to bits. You see them around the world, and, and they are just marvellous vehicles. They're far better than anything else. And once you've ridden in one, it's an unforgettable experience. My first recollection was Uncle Bert taking me and his daughter Amanda to school every morning in his... And that was a very old Land Rover. And I don't know why, but it always seemed far more exciting sitting sideways, bouncing up and down like that, going to school, than it ever would sitting in a normal saloon car. And I think, as well, the recollection that I have of that, apart from bouncing up and down, is the smell. There's a smell about a Land Rover which is unique. I started with my first Land Rover when I was 13. Father said, here's your car you're going to learn to drive in. Now put it together. It was a box of bits that a customer had got bored with and said, use it for spares. And Brian just said to me, well, put it together and you can learn to drive and, and use it. I don't drive cars, I don't like cars. You can't see what's coming or see where you've been. At least with a Land Rover, you can see over the hedge. Here she goes. As the sun set on the British Empire from the suburbs of Solihull came a machine which would carry the flag of British industry to the edges of the earth. For the fearless Land Rover, no road is too rough. This was the first and finest 4x4. Land Rover came about really as a temporary measure. The idea was that the Rover company needed a vehicle that they could export, because if they didn't export, they wouldn't get ration, the rations of steel that the government was issuing to motor manufacturers. Um, they intended to uh, make this thing for four or five years and then go back to making saloon cars. But in fact, it was far more successful than they'd envisaged. And within two or three years, it was selling three times as many as the cars. They call me Mr. Lanro because I was one of the original five designers of the vehicle. We five designers started this vehicle, designed it and got it into production within 12 months. I never thought at that time that it would go on, but of course, as soon as I'd started and found out what it could do, what we could do, I realised it was a vehicle for all time. How does it feel all these years later? Oh, it makes me feel very proud. This was the basis of all Land Rovers, really. A chassis constructed of bits of steel welded together because of the fact that we couldn't get enough rations of steel. The engine from the car, the dash, and on top of this, we was able to fit all the different bodies, many hundreds, in fact, that the customers required throughout the world. The production line itself was rather primitive in the early days. Uh, the chassis were cut as blank by ourselves in the guillotine shop and welded outside the main assembly sheds. The space in which you could work was minimal, about two foot square. And they used to say that if you reach about 35, you're too old to be on the track. So they gave you a line side job doing sub-assemblies or helping you feed things on. I have to say that with the Land Rover, you get this feeling of invulnerability, that there is no hillside, no gully, no mountain that you cannot climb and come off better. 
it's a, a feeling that brings out the explorer in you. The Oxford and Cambridge Far Eastern Expedition set up a new record. Normal 86-inch wheelbase Land Rover station wagons painted dark blue and light blue in friendly rivalry. The Jeep ceased production after the war. The Rovers brought out this, this vehicle, which I understand they didn't know at the time how successful it was going to be. And it has evolved into the most magnificent four-wheel drive cross-country vehicle ever built. Not all the bridges have stood the test of time on this unused road. You have to keep driving when you're in the water in order to prevent the water going up the exhaust pipe. And the other thing we realized was not to get water all over the electrics in, in the car. And um, we used to do that by disconnecting the van belt. We met a tea planter who said, uh, do come and stay the night with us, which we were extremely glad of the invitation. And he said, oh, just follow me. The road's a bit tricky, but I expect you to manage. And we said, oh, yes, we're expert at that sort of thing. It'll be a doddle. And eventually we came to a suspension bridge, which had a notice on it which said, uh, only suitable for nine pack horses, and had been built, I think, in 1909. And when we got to the middle and the depression of the uh, deck was so great, I thought the end had come. There was a ravine uh, several hundred feet deep below me and the road rising in front of me, and I wondered whether I'd actually get up the slope. And that ability to climb slopes has created a new cult, off-roading. Now... This section up through here looks pretty impassable. I don't know if you can get a shot of it, Baz. Should really test the beast through there. Thar she blows, Baz. Thar she blows indeed. We've got eight miles of sweat and terror through there. There's a couple of mean gullies, a bitch of a hill, and what could only be described as the mother of all ditches. <laughs> no problems for us then, eh, sir? It is sorted. It's gripped. Let's off-road! <laughs> Stand back, you killer. We'll flatten you. <laughs> the Land Rover. A tough, chunky, cheeky, versatile But vehicle. those early Land Rovers weren't meant as off-roaders, but earnest agricultural workhorses. The tough and tenacious American wartime Willys Jeep had caught the attention of Rover car boss Morris Wilkes. He used one on his Anglesey estate and reckoned that post-war Britain would buy a go-anywhere utility vehicle. And he was right. In just 12 months, the Land Rover was on the market. In 1947, Nancy Jones was working a remote Welsh hill farm and had heard about this revolutionary new farm vehicle. She beat a path to her dealer's door. Well, the farm was called Della Wen, and it was a hill farm. We simply kept cheap and just a few domestic cows that we really needed a vehicle to get all the produce up to the house and the, there wasn't a bridge on the river had to go through the ford. And then I heard about the new Land River coming out. So I thought that would be rather nice. Well, I went to Land W, went to the garage, and I said, I hear you've been allocated three, three Land Rovers for the county. And I said, I want one. I'm one of your customers, and I think I'm a, the most worthy cause. And they didn't argue with me, they gave it me. We had a horse called Jolly, she was a working horse. And um, so one day we decided we'd try and take out some farm manure with a Land Rover. And she, and she watched us the whole afternoon, she wouldn't settle down to graze at all. As if she knew we were taking on her work. But the Land Rover had yet another string to its bow. Before long, the world's military had become the biggest customers. From troop carrier to amphibious vehicle to radio van, Land Rovers would be conscripted into virtually every theater of war, bought by no less than 147 armies and police forces. The Solihull factory had stumbled into a market bigger than their wildest imaginings, a market without a single competitor. And the Land Rover's National Service helped its civilian development. 
tested to destruction, made bigger, better, stronger, and even more versatile. The Rover Company were obliged to make bigger vehicles to carry larger payloads. Uh, they were obliged to provide a diesel engine as an alternative to the petrol engine, and in due course, more powerful engines. All these factors, I think, were brought about by market forces. It was the customers demanding change, and Land Rover responded to that. But some things never changed. That famous boxy shape was far too good to muck about with. Change uh, didn't happen very often. And when it did, it seemed to take a lot of people by surprise that they've they got to do something about it. In the styling department, we did a comprehensive exercise on a, uh, a vehicle that got itself known as, named as uh, 111. And it didn't really get any further than reasonably large-scale drawings and proposals uh, for the very simple reason that there was no real call for a new Land Rover. They are quite happy with the one they were producing. It wasn't as though we were sort of getting very dated. It was still selling very, very well, and that's a hard nut to crack if you want to propose something new. And there was another good reason not to change a thing. A certain celebrated couple gave the Land Rover instant social acceptability. Suddenly, the workhorse was fashionable. My Land Rover was built for the Queen Mother in 1965 with a six-cylinder Rover car engine. And it has chassis number QM1. Um, we understand that Prince Philip went to Africa and saw other vehicles with six-cylinder engines in, came back to England and said to Land Rover, I want a six-cylinder. It's got lovely deluxe front seats, which were fitted in, in fact, in 1967. Um, it's got a wireless in the front, uh, uh, an old-fashioned wireless, with speakers in the middle and at the back. So obviously the racing results could, uh, could be listened to by everybody. And it's a 10-seater version and not a 12-seater version, which is quite rare. And for that very special customer, Land Rover would go to enormous lengths to fit those little touches that mean so much. If one is fond of carrying one's pets around with one, it's surprising what one might need, like an interior rear window wiper for the condensation from the corgi's breath. Isn't that right, Clarence? From monarchs to mud pluggers, there seem no limit to the creativity of those clever people at Soli Hull. And if you're looking for the weirdest and wackiest incarnations, pay a visit to the Bashel family and the Dunsfold Land Rover Trust. Deep in leafy Surrey, Brian and his son Philip have spent a large chunk of their lives preserving some of the more unusual bits of the Land Rover story. thing we like to save pre-production or development vehicles because the main manufacturers unfortunately don't have a collecting policy for the prototypes or, or development vehicles they tend to collect the first or the last of every production run which is great fine but nobody seems to collect the in-between models which is where we like to step in Collector or not, they're addictive creatures. You don't just own a Land Rover, you become part of it. I, I don't like to see a nice vehicle rot, and I am watching it rot. Um, I won't let it completely rot, something, you know, the last gas, I'll suddenly you know, decide to, to, to have it done. But it, it's because of our early years, I mean, there's great sentimental value um, to us because we had such fun in it. It was grey. You can, you can still see a little bit of grey on the, on, on the corner, but uh, we, we actually just bought a, a, a tin of Dulux and a couple of rushes and we painted it white. I don't know why we decided to paint it white. We should have painted it camouflage colours really, so that it wouldn't stick out in the countryside. Um, but we decided to paint it white. <laughs> Young and foolish. <laughs> 
Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. We came over the Alps and I forgot to check the, uh, the water and the, the what do you call it, wasn't working, the temperature gauge wasn't working. And uh, we just forgot to, to, to check the water. And suddenly steam came belching out of it and uh, we ground to a halt. And uh, fortunately there was a garage nearby in a, a little French workshop and this guy came along and looked at it and said, oh, oh il faut démonter tout ça. We have to take it all to, <laughs> to pieces. And uh, he spent a day on it, put us back together, and off we went. That's the great thing about the Land Rover. You could always find something to do. I would say that it is one of the greatest success stories of the British manufacturing world. It's been now from 1947 until the present time, still running, still building, as nearly as many as we ever did. It shows that it is what we thought it was. A success story without end. With sales approaching two million, Land Rovers have become a national institution. They've been imitated but never bettered, and even formed the basis for yet another Solihull legend the sharp-suited Range Rover. So next time you see one of the scores of modern 4x4s, just pause for thought and remember that it was all started by that little green machine from Birmingham. In this job, you're apt to get a wee bit blasé, a bit cynical about cars. But in the last 10 days, I must have driven, what, a dozen Land Rovers, all different shapes and sizes, and I've come away mightily impressed. So guess what I've just bought? Stars on Wheels next week at the same time.